OPS is also what we're working on at the moment to integrate that as a back end. So that's, a, that's basically how we're delivering in the short term uh, GPU support because that's already specialized for GPUs. Um, so what does the performance look like? Um, so out of the box, um, with like just that bit of code that I showed up above, um, we, we just did uh, four experiments with different spatial order. So this is the standard um, ISO, 3D isoacoustic model running on Skylake, uh, a nice big uh, grid size in 3D. Um, so out of the box without the geophysicists need to do anything, we're achieving say between say 36 and 59% of, of peak. Um, so for people that, like, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to explain what a roofline model is now. You're going to have to take my word for it that this is uh, important and good. Um, but like for, it, it basically means that this is, this, is the, this is a hard limit on the possible performance that could be achieved given that bit of hardware. Um, so you're achieving, in this case, 36% out of the box. This now is when we use the ask. So the benefit of moving to a specialized backend is like you have someone that knows silicon that has signed all the relevant NDAs and knows exactly what needs to be done to squeeze out all performance. And they achieve, say, between 62 and 63. So this is the advantage of having that specialized backend plugged into the Vita. And this is pretty much like the, the highest performance that we know of any code being uh, like implemented on the Intel. <coughs> Uh, people might quibble over this because of their definition of a roof line, but we can argue about that over coffee. Um, this is the same thing now on the KNL, with no change whatsoever made to the code, or no KNL uh, specific optimizations. So out of the box, without changing anything, we're getting about 10% of peak. But again, because we have integrated YASC into the back end, we use YASC then, and we're getting between 39 and 43% of peak. And once again, for all of these other operations, we haven't had to change the code. We just change a single number and it generates the appropriate code. Um, keep an eye on my time. So the, the, the nice thing is even when we are not achieve, when we say, okay, there's, there's, there's more performance optimizations that we can do, the key thing to understand is that these optimizations lie on, um, on a roadmap that's quite easy to understand and to get to grips with. And then in terms of the long-term development of these of uh, frameworks such as this, you pretty much know what is the next optimization you need to include in your compiler to get it up to that next level. Um, so this was a plot done by Chuck, which is quite useful. So you can see vector folding was a key optimization done in YASC, and you can see that de delivered nearly a doubling in performance, and you can see then all the other sort of standard optimizations. So you're pretty much walking your way across this set of oper operations. It's all been done inside the compiler, so it's been automated, so humans don't have to do it. Uh, but you can reason your, your way forward in terms of what should be added to the compiler. Uh, this is TTI. So TTI, everything gets a lot more complicated. Like say, a, a lot of results talking about performance analysis, they focus on ISO 3D, but this is really problematic because it actually hides an awful lot of uh, performance issues that you only actually see when you run a real kernel such as TTI. Um, so what, what's, uh, th this, this graph is a bit busy, but it basically boils down to uh, one of the advantages of the Vita, we can apply some of these exo more exotic uh, optimizations that do flop reduction. So in this case, if you naively look at this number, you say, well, this is, we can read off whatever that uh, gigaflop performance is for TTI 16th order. But then we do a bunch of flop reducing operations. We're actually reducing the number of operations that are, um, that are being executed. So we're lowering the operational intensity. Uh, but then because we've reduced the number of flops required, it actually speeds up. So in this case, we get a speed up of three, even though it looks like we have moved from the compute bound to the memory bound regime. So yeah, roof lines are great, but they can sometimes be a bit misleading. In the interest of time, I'll just skip on a small bit. Um, so we recently got MPI support at it. So, uh, nothing needs to change from the user perspective. So the geophysicist doesn't care. None of their code has changed. Everything happens at the back end. On the Python level, like the domain decomposition is based on MPI Cartesian grid abstractions. We uh, developed a new package, uh, NumPy, to handle anything on the Python side. So that all worked nicely in, with MPI without needing to change any code. 
and all the source and receivers and so on are distributed automatically. On the C level, um, the, uh, because we go because of the, 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 the because of the way the compiler is designed, we're able to go through and analyze automatically like where communications must occur. So there's no redundant uh, there's no redundant uh, communications. So you can optimize that quite well. And and I haven't I'm not showing performance results because we've just got to the stage for MPI that is currently passing the entire test suite. Like we were counting it up, we have as much, uh, we have as many lines of code in our suite of tests as we have actually in the actual code base of the compiler. So it gives you a degree of the amount of testing that goes into this. So all of that's currently passing. And uh, come back, uh, like check in with us again at SEG to see what the actual power performance numbers are. So conclusion. Um, I think we're confident in our claim that uh, DeVito is a high productivity, high performance uh, Python framework for finite differences. Uh, I think we achieve both and it's important to achieve both. Um, it's, it's primarily driven by the demands of FWI and RTM. Um, so we've worked closely with the SLIM team in the academic front and they built Judy, like a Julia framework on top of this. Uh, it's also heavily, uh, it was a lot, of, a lot of interaction and sweat went into getting it ready for commercial use with Doug. So getting lots of feedback from them, what was missing, what stuff needed to be added to make it actually useful for industry. It's important to, to underscore that it's an interdisciplinary, interinstitutional, international research effort. It was super important for us to make this open source because that was the only way to bring the community along with us and to make friends basically to help us like, solve what is an incredibly challenging problem. Uh, and we're just starting a new uh, open source uh, consortium with the support of uh, Shell, NVIDIA. And we're trying to get more people like, you know, to, to get on board and uh, to support this sort of community project. And that's our website. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Um, you talked about SIMD. Uh, so do you, do you have to use intrinsics, or will the compiler just vectorize for you? It, it vectorizes for you. So we take care of all of that. Yeah, tr like, yeah. Like the last thing you want is humans to be writing intrinsics into their code. Yeah. But it's OK if you get a machine to do it for you. Right, but sometimes it's hard to get the compiler vectors for you. No, that's, why, that's why exactly what the Vito does. So it's designed to figure all of that out for you and to force the compiler to do the right thing. Thank you, it was very interesting. Um, I have a lots of questions, but for now, uh, it's very similar to a finite difference flavor of Phoenix, right? Sorry, say that again? Like finite difference flavor of Phoenix, Phoenix project. Oh, Phoenix. So this is what I, like, I should have said, so I love saying this, is we're huge fans of the Phoenix uh, community and uh, like for finite element. That was designed for finite element. And we often joke with them that we just rip off all of their ideas and apply it to finite differences. So exactly this, we exactly try to uh, re be the Phoenix, if you like, for finite differences. And uh, what, uh, Time integration schemes do you support? Because you showed that you are supporting Laplace or Nafla operators. So everything Nafla. is uh, currently uh, explicit uh, time stepping schemes, like multi level explicit time stepping schemes. And largely that's just reflecting what the community have been demanding. Um, we've also talked about adding implicit methods uh, using iterative solvers. And I think, well, we know how to do it because, of course, we're very familiar with uh, the Phoenix and Firedrake communities. Uh, and largely, it's down to the demand of the community and the number of bodies that we have programming. Yeah. Um, you mentioned TTI is one of the challenging things, looking at that yeah. particular kernel. Actually, I think the real challenge is when you put boundary condition into the picture. What is your take on that? I mean, doing stencil computation and optimization, this is great, but really things start falling, uh, you know, yeah. breakdown as soon as you put real boundary conditions like CPML, you know. Thank you for asking industry. me. It was the very first time we presented this was at EAGE, and it was actually Bill Science. Says, oh yeah, it looks very nice, but what do you do about boundary conditions? And we went, <coughs> <laughs> Um, so basically, yeah, all kinds of exotic boundary conditions are supported. Like basically what we did was, there isn't a clean abstraction for boundary conditions and finite differences. So instead we just hand over the tools to the users that it's very easy to, to express any type of expression that you want for boundary conditions. So people have implemented PMLs and all kinds of things. So let's, one more question. 
Oh, cool. If not, thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Thanks, our speaker, yeah.